Good morning. Good morning. I'm back. Uh, I don't know whether that felt good to have me away for three weeks or whether it was something different. But um, just a little note on what happened is that I was driving back. I was planning on getting back Saturday night. And you know I have wonderful eyes. and But my... Um, I kept pulling to the right and kept hitting the rumble strip. And I'm going, man, are my eyes really doing this to me tonight? And so I, I said, you know, I'm, I need to be safe for other drivers. And so I pulled off at Gaylord and got a motel and said, you know, I just can't make it. Well, I got up in the morning and I found out why the car was pulling to the right and that I had a right front flat tire. And um, luckily, I pulled off at Gaylord and did not have to change that tire on the expressway uh, in the dark. It, on Sunday morning, I got up, I saw that it was, you know, I thought, okay, you know, ready to go. Got up in the car, seemed to be pulling to the right in the driveway. I said, okay, there's something not quite right. And I, all of a sudden, uh, these new cars tell you what you're doing wrong or what they've got wrong. And I said, right front tire, very low. So I pulled across the street into the gas station. I was going to put some air in the tire. And a gentleman pulled in behind me with a pickup truck and a trailer. He goes, sir, do you know you have a flat tire? And I'm thinking, that, yeah, it's kind of obvious. But um, he goes, because, you know, Sometimes these trucks, you can drive on them and they don't even feel like they got a flat tire. So, well, it's pulling to the right and I was going to put some air in it. He goes, all right, let, you know, do you got a compressor? I said, yeah, I put some air in it. And it was coming out almost as fast as it was going in. <laughs> and I looked and there was, he noticed that there was a place where it had pinched. Be, I must have run into a curb. Um, with my wonderful peripheral vision on the right hand side and uh, pinched that tire so that there was a, a air bleed in it. He goes, well, do you uh, know where the tire station is? And I said, nope. He goes, well, let me, let me lead you down there. And he took me down, we pulled into Johnson's Tire. They were closed. They weren't open on Sunday. Now, he says they're always open on Sunday, but why aren't they open today? And I said, I don't know. Several cars came in to get gas there and do things, and I just kept going, well, you know, we got to figure out, I've got to get this tire changed so I can get back. I had never taken the tire off of that, the spare tire off of the truck. It took us almost an hour to figure out how to get the tire down out of the back of the truck so that then we could change the tire, then we had to change the tire, and then we had to figure out how to get it back up. And as we were talking, I found out that uh, the gentleman that had stopped was a retired pastor. And so we started talking a little bit about that. And I said, you know, it's really nice to know that a retired pastor would be willing to stop and help somebody when they have a need. He goes, isn't that what we're supposed to do? And I said, yes, I'm just trying to get some levity back in my life for the moment. We got our fix, got on the way, I finally got back here, found out on Thursday that one of our guys, and I hadn't been feeling well all week, one of our guys had come down with COVID while we were on the trip. And I figured that's probably what happened, why I was so um, lethargic most of the week and had all the, the runny nose and all that kind of stuff. I just thought I had worn myself out. So either he gave it to me or I gave it to him. I do not know, but it was a wonderful three weeks because I've been off for basically three weeks. I went to training the first week and it was wonderful. I ended up sitting at dinner or breakfast, lunch, or dinner six out of the 12 meals with Bishop Bard. And he and I had a wonderful time getting to know each other. Uh, had great training, came back,
spent two days working on the house that Robin and I bought for our retirement and then got on the road, ended up down in Detroit where we need to be in deep prayer for the people of the Detroit area because the area that we were working in flooded again. Now the home that we worked on, the two homes that we worked on, were still waiting to get worked on from the flood of 2021, two years later. We were able to do quite a bit of work on the one house and we got David filled with poison ivy at the other house and yeah, lucky David. But there is going to be more work and more information that can be done with that as we continue forward. But so I'm back and we will begin with our time of worship. There's a nominations committee listed here. I understand that most of the team won't be there so we will get out the information to them and not make them come and have to sit in a room alone with me. That can be a difficult thing at times. But we'll, other than that, the rest of the week is pretty much normal. So I invite us to be in prayer on this day. Gracious God, as we come to you, we come from many places in our lives. Some of us have been having a wonderful week, others have been having a so-so week, others have been dealing with all the things that can happen in life. And yet we've come and we pray that you will be present with us. Yet we know that you already are. And so we pray even more so that we will be present with you. So open up our hearts and our lives to this day, to this time of worship, that we might lift up our hearts in song and in prayer, and that your word will speak to us this day. We just ask your blessing now in the name of your Son. Amen. Our, we're going to stand to sing forever with... Um, the other side of Grace video.
Please join with me in the call to worship. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and glad. Take up residence within us to shape our hearts, minds, and we will according to the pattern of Jesus. You let us know the thoughts of God, let us feel as God feels, and empower us to make decisions as God would make them. Fit us for heaven, even as we journey the earth. Do your work upon us each and every day, so that when the time comes for our departure, who have been trained in the ways of the kingdom, finish the course set before us, and be ready to take our place in the eternal kingdom, prepared for those who love God and follow his Son. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture lesson is from 1 Corinthians 2, 
verses 14 through 18. It is on the screen in front of you. Those who are unspiritual spiritual, do not receive the gift of God, of God's Spirit, for they are foolish to them. They are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritually discerned all things, and they are themselves subject to no more, no one else's scrutiny. For who knows the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? We have the mind of Christ. So we need the reading, reading of his word. that we 
we may hear your voice more clearly this day and every day. We pray this, O Lord, in the name of your Son. Amen. Paul starts out this part of this passage with saying, those who are not, those who are unspiritual, do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. <clears throat> One of the things that I keep hearing people say over their, over the time when I am listening to how people are living their lives and opening themselves up and trying to find out what does it mean, they say, I just don't know how to listen to God. I don't ever hear him. I don't know what to do. And the reality is, is that as we grow in our faith, we have to trust in God. And we have to trust that the messages that we receive from God, through others, through our own reading, through our prayers, through those things that are happening in our lives, that they will speak to us and help us understand who we are and whose we are, and that they will help us to understand what God is calling us to and where God is calling us to go. When we speak about the spiritual gifts, Paul lists a group of them, but there are more. They are not just limited there. We are each given spiritual gifts according to our ability to receive them. And when we think that we have not received them, we have to look at who we are and how we are relating to God. If we're expecting that, that we're going to say, hey God, I believe in you, but um, yeah, when you get a chance, give them to me because I, um, I really don't have time to put my energy into cultivating this, this part of my life. We're not going to receive a whole lot because God will know that it will just bounce off of us that we won't hear, that we won't receive, that we won't put those gifts to work. So if we are doubting in the fact that God can give us gifts, we are putting up a barrier and saying, God, I really don't want them. Now, the reason I can say that is because I know in my own life that that I have put up those barriers before, that I have come to the place where I've said, those gifts over there, those don't count because they're not what I like. They're not who I am, they're not what I want. And so therefore, I'm not going to be able to receive them. But these ones I like, and therefore I'm going to pay. But God looks at us and says, I'm going to give to you what you need to be able to be the person I need you to be in this world for the building of my kingdom. Now when we begin to listen to God that way, when we begin to understand that God is working in us, whether we want to realize it or not, or God wants to be working in us, even if we try and shut us out, he is there hoping dreaming, loving on us, that we will become the people he would call us to be. What breaks my heart is that so much of the world, and even much of the, many of the people in the church want to claim the prize at the end of the journey without taking the journey. And the journey of faith, the journey of life and faith takes us to that place where it builds in us and grows in us that spiritual being that opens us up to who God wants us to be and where God wants us to be and how he wants us to be and where we are serving. The 
this, after, this evening at 7 o'clock, I'm going to be having a, a Zoom meeting with the team that I took on this uh, work down in Detroit. And one of the questions that I've asked them in, uh, in, in some questions for them to ponder before we meet is, where did you see God in this event? How did God work in you? And how have you grown? Because if we are not looking for God, and if we are not searching God in our lives, we will completely miss a lot of God sightings in our lives. Now, God sightings are those things where we see God at work in our lives or in others or in the world so that we can say, yes, Lord, yes. If we keep our blinders on and we don't look to see and we aren't searching for, we will miss those opportunities to experience that, that place of connection between God and us. And sometimes we can watch it and we can see the things at just the right time. And we think, wow, that was really cool. I needed that right now. I'm going to tell you, I certainly believe that God sightings, those places where, where we see the power and the presence of God, are not there just because they were a happenstance, but they were there so that God could let us know of his grace and his presence. And the more we seek and the more we search for those places, the more we will see God at work in the people around us. The more that we journey, the more we take that, that walk of faith, the more we will find ourselves stepping into those, uh, those opportunities to let God speak to us and to let God change our lives and to grow us into who he wants us to be. And yet, there are other times when right after we have that, we go, okay, I've made it. I'm all set. Any of you had that point where you've got you, you've maybe you've come home from a, a retreat or come home from an experience or vacation? Ah, oh, that was everything I needed, and you go, I'm good right here, and then you just stop. Problem is, that's just the opening of the door, and if we don't keep the doors open, we won't keep seeing where God is calling us to be. And if we don't keep looking, we will stop our spiritual journey. And I know a lot of people who have stopped their spiritual journey because they've run up to a brick wall and thought, oh, everything I believed is gone because I can't get through this thing. St. John of the Cross talks about the dark night of the soul that as we seek to find God, as we come to that place where we really are at the point of being in true fellowship with God, that sometimes it feels like we are completely empty and that God is not there and he is nowhere around to be seen. And yet in the midst of that, it is not God who is missing. It is our life running up against that place of total dependence on God. And when we let down those barriers, and sometimes those barriers last for a day, sometimes they last for a week, sometimes they last for a month. St. John of the Cross said his lasted for years before he finally got to the place where he knew that that place where he felt so empty and alone was where God was working in him, preparing him for that place of true presence with God. And so when Paul talks about become, those who are unspiritual are those who, who, who give up too easy, who stop before they get to the end zone, I 
I learned when I was in eighth grade that, that I was not a distance runner. I tried to run cross country. Okay, and I, I put the emphasis on tried because I could run about from here to the back of the sanctuary and I would be out of breath. And then I'd have to walk. And then I'd take off running again. And then I'd have to stop and walk. I'd have to take off running again. I'd have to stop and walk. And all the other guys, by the time I got to the first curve in, in the path that we had to go, some of the top runners were already coming around. And they were lapping me. I found out later that, you know, I kept trying to run, but I couldn't. And I found out later in my life that I had asthma, and that's why I could not run, because I could not breathe. I could not get the, the carbon dioxide out of my chest so that I could get oxygen in. Well, I learned that it was better for me not to run, so I quit running. I found some other things that I could do. Sometimes the the plot, the, the, the barriers that we that we run into are there so that we have to find the path that we need to go into. Sometimes when we are moving forward and and we just seem like we've hit that wall, we have to look and see if it's just a turn in the road. To see if it's not like the prayer labyrinth that there are no places to get lost. You just have to be willing to turn with the path. And yet, we can go on and walk and walk and keep walking into the wall. Keep walking into the wall because we're afraid to turn. Where is God challenging you in your life to make a turn, to make a difference, to see something different in your life? So that you are able to grow into that next level, into that next step, into that next direction. Or have you given up and said, I've made it, I'm already there. The problem is when we think we've made it, is right at the time when we really need to take that next step. I was challenged here when we were on the, this retreat because somebody had turned off the one light that we had been leaving on at night so you could find your way to the restroom. And I didn't grab my flashlight or my headlight because I assumed that it was going to be on. And so this is how I walked. And I found the stair that I had to go down, there were four stairs, and I found it because I was had my hands out and I ran into the railing beforehand. And I could have stopped right there. I would have gotten in trouble, but, um, so I turned, went down those steps and found the light switch because I knew where the light switch was. I could have gotten stuck there. But sometimes we have to put our hands out and see where it is that we're going, check and see where the opening is so that God can help us in that walk. Because it's when we are willing to listen to what God has to say, whether we know it in our hearts and our lives or whether we have to listen to it through other people and God is speaking to us, or we do it, listen to it through our reading or our prayers or even our bodies. We find that we are given what we need to move forward. One of my favorite passages, in fact, I think it's my, my life passages, uh, Jacob, when he is called by God to go back to his home country, and as he is on his way back, he hears that his brother, his older brother Esau, is in the country, and he 
has to meet him on the way. And Jacob, now if you remember, Jacob was a prankster. Jacob did everything he needed to do to get whatever it was that he wanted. And he had, he had ticked off his older brother so many times that he wasn't sure whether he could go back and even meet his brother. And so there, as he was on his way, one of the scouts up ahead came back and said, your brother Esau is coming, and he's got 400 soldiers with him. And Jacob thought, believe me, I'm in trouble now. But now Jacob had, had raised up many flocks of, and, 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 and herds of cattle, and, and so he had, he had slaves, and he had children, and, he had, and so he broke them up into groups and sent them on and, and gave them to Esau as said that they were going to be gifts to Esau. And he moved everybody over except for he was afraid to go. There he was on the side of the river of Jabbok. And that night he prayed to God going, I don't know what I need to do. I don't know what I can do. I'm so scared I'm going to get my tail in kicked. What should I do? And God showed up. Remember what God did that night? Remember what Jacob did that night? They wrestled with each other to see who would win out, to see whose will would be stronger. And they wrestled all the way through the night until the daybreak. And God said, okay, enough, let go. You're not going to win. And Jacob said, I'm not going to let go until you tell me your name so I can tell them who I wrestled with. Because you don't need to know my name. But because you wrestled with God all night, your name will be changed. And you'll no longer be Jacob, but you'll be Israel. And then God clipped him in the hip and threw his hip out the joint. And when he met his brother, he was walking with a limp. But what happened when he crossed that river? His brother welcomed him in a way that he would never have expected it to be. And he was welcomed home. Well, that that passage has been a passage that has been mine as I have gone through my life and gone through ministry. I've had times when I've had to work trying to figure out where to go, how I was going to wrestle, what was going to happen. And I have wrestled with God and it always seems that God wins. Not because I quit, but because I learn from what God has shared. This summer has been a summer of wrestling for me. Many things have happened this summer. I, I was in two car accidents. Now, you probably didn't know that, but I had two people run into me in the same place on my car, and my truck is getting fixed right now. And I, neither of those were my fault but they might have been able to be avoided if I had eyes to see. Some other things that have happened this, this year is that I've been working, and one of the things that I've noticed is that the, the more I work and I have to, the more that I have to do at the computer, the harder it is for me to see, and so the harder it is for me to see, the more I have to work at the have to work at trying to see it, the more I try and see it, the less I can see. And that vicious cycle has been coming over and over and over again. And those things, along with the other health issues that have come, I've been in conversation with Robin, I've been in conversation with our district superintendent, with our leadership board, and in wrestling with God, I really did not want to lose. My plan was to be here at least for another two and a half years or three or longer. But I can't do the work anymore that you need me to do. And I 
can't do the things that need to be done as a pastor to move this thing, this congregation forward. And so, in conversation and consultation with the district superintendent, having the blessing of the bishop while I sat with him at, at lunch and dinner and breakfast at the conference and talking with Robin and talking with the leadership board, I'm going to invite you to a party. It's a New Year's Eve party. Except for it'll happen the morning of December 31st. And that is, that will be my last Sunday as a full-time pastor. I, um, on that, as I've looked at that, I've come to, I started coming up. That will be 43 years, four months, and 29 days that I've been a pastor. I turned 65 on September 13th, so I'll make it past my 65th birthday, which is one of those things I wanted to do. And I was just gonna get beyond there. But what that means is that it should not be a time of sadness. Because as I have wrestled with God, and I'll tell you what I've wrestled with God. I have had I've had some yelling matches, I've had some some times when he has just wanted to, I could just feel him shaking me, saying, Look, there's so much more that I need you to do in a different way. This last week, or in the two week last two weeks, um, the training I went through and the leading that I did on this trip proved to me one thing. I'm a better teacher than I am a leader. Not because I can't lead, but because I can't be out on the, in the field because I became a safety hazard for the team. But I have other places where God is calling me to serve. God is calling you to have a pastor who will take where we've come in the last two and a half years and go, where do we need to go now and how can we get there? And it is going to be everything that will be on my heart to, to help us move towards receiving a new pastor here at Wesley. I know for some it may be a shock, for some it may be a joy, for some it may be just, um, is he really saying this? And yes, I am. Things have fallen into place. It was funny. We, we've been looking for over two years for a house to retire in. And one day we both got an email that a new house had come on the market. I looked at it and sent an email to Robin and said, you need to look at this house because I think it's one we need to look at. And she saw it, she sent me an email that said, you need to look at this house because it's one we need to look at. That Saturday, she went out to drive around and walk around the place and, and um, she took pictures and was doing a FaceTime walk and I was getting to see the outside of it. And we said, well, why don't you, I said, why don't you call the realtor and see if, if they can come. The realtor came out and we walked through the house. I was on FaceTime. She was in person. We made the decision between seeing the house on Thursday or in our email to looking at it on Saturday to making an offer on Monday to closing two weeks later that we are ready. And it happened like that. And it had to be a God thing. Because we've been looking and everything that I've liked before, she didn't. Everything that she liked before, I didn't. Because there was something about it that didn't fit. We walked in after we closed and we walked in together and, and, and we both said, you know what, this feels like home already. Plus it has my pole barn, it's got a 28 by 40 pole barn and you know, I get to move all my stuff and have, have access to it so I can sort it out and get rid of what I don't need and use what I can and, and all that. But God is moving in this. So 
So I invite you, because this was a very difficult decision for me to make, it made me have to realize a lot of things. One is my body is not working the way it needs to to be able to lead the congregation the way I need to lead it. My eyes are not working because uh, two accidents later, I could be in trouble. And when I get there, I can be close to home and Robin can drive me when we need to go somewhere else. We're in an area that we're going to want to be. But you, if you look at where we are, and you ask the question of where we need to go, it is time, for I've done what needed to be done in the time that I've been here. And I've prepared a way for a new pastor to come in and step in to place. And so as we do that, I pray that this will be a celebration. I've come to know and love many of you. Some of you, I'm still trying to figure out who you are because I can't see your face well enough to know it. But with that, I, I share when we are a spiritual being, if we are listening to God and listening to the things that God puts in our lives, he will show us where we need to go, what we need to do, and how we need to go there. And so I invite you to be open, to take those next steps of faith, to continue in the journey to look and see what God has in store for you today and tomorrow and the next. I'm not retiring from life and I'm not retiring from faith and I'm not retiring from ministry. I'm just retiring from full-time ministry in the church because God has much more that he needs me and wants me to do. And it is the same for you. May God work in you that you might have the mind of Christ, as Paul says, to see and receive the spiritual gifts and that they might be discerned in making you who you are and who you can become. Amen.
going to start with a prayer of joy from Shirley Hicks to a friend of mine and a compatriot. Happy birthday, Dorothy! Woo! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear! for the family of my friend Terry. She passed away last week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer from Barbara Paul Mackey for Vance, Stacy, Pat, and Wendy regarding health concerns. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prayer from, unfortunately, I can't read the name, for Wesley Sunday School Program, Thanksgiving for those who are volunteering for Sunday, more volunteers needed, our children need us, let Pam know if you can, if you feel called to help. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer from, uh, oh, another one for Dorothy Coons. Happy birthday. <laughs> God is good. All the A concern raised by Dorothy for Anne Marie, Brian, Bruce, and Tracy, ongoing health concerns. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. A prayer from Dorothy Coon for Chris Colton. Continued healing from brain surgery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prayer from Linda Quayle, from Susan Hilla. Hilla. She's having some good weeks. Pray for continued strength to be able to get her liver um, transplant in time. Both a joy for the health. God is good. Turn for the transplant, Lord, in your mercy. Your prayer from Linda Quayle for a preteen boy, guided to God's grace to get him through a dilemma. Lord, in your mercy. Your Hear our prayer. prayer. A prayer for from Linda Quayle, Becky in for Becky and Vince, strength and good grace and strength and God's grace and strength to get through what obstacles they may be enduring. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer for Linda Quayle, for herself, for migraines in natural? Vertigo. Vertigo, sorry. Don't, don't, don't like to ask for prayers for myself. We all need to acknowledge that, and we are gifts from God, and we are just as important. So, God, in your mercy. Yeah. A prayer from Pam Obrin for teachers, students, and all school employees, their safety and health, that they can have a great year. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And I'm going to add something to do that. Prayer for the teachers, their joy. God is good. From Pam, our country, that we begin to live again together, even when we disagree. We can be a people of grace, compassion, and understanding. Amen. Amen. Lord, Lord, in your mercy. And this one's from Pam. I'll join her in that for our church. God's church here in this community. 
to seek and find God's wisdom and guidance. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our and for my friend on the piano, the leader over there, I'm Diane Johnson. For grandson Mitchell, clean of a dislocated, broken wrist, he sees the orthopedic on Tuesday. I understand he's currently in a splint and they can't get the, the uh, wrist to go back in place right now, so it's very uncomfortable. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. In both a concern and a joy from David McCartney for our pastor, a joy that he's been here to help me to guide through it, and a concern for the walk he had through Florida. So, God is good. All and Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, Bob. Let us pray. Come to God throughout this last week. For those who were down working saw the ravages that are continuing to be dealt with as a result of floods two years ago, and yet this week, two days in a row, the rains came and the floods came again. And some of those same homes that we saw possibly that we worked in were flooded once again. We pray for those who are without power still and for the workers who are putting electrical lines back up. We pray for safety. We pray for diligence and we pray for patience on the part of the people who are living in their homes but getting frustrated because power does not come back that fast. Let that whole situation, again, be under your guidance and may your, your peace and your patience and your understanding be there in their midst. We give you thanks for, for church that is able to live forward, that when we continue to go forward and we continue to follow you, though we may have differences with others, we can find ways that we can work together or side by side. And as we continue to move forward into the future of the United Methodist Church, we, we pray that you will guide us in what that means and the ministries that we are called to be in. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you will show us your way, that you will break our hearts and soften our minds and allow us to hear your word, your will, your direction, so that as we are seeking to be your people, that we are taking one step further on the path that we are finding one more way to receive you and hear your voice. Help us to become those people you have called us to be. Help us to become those who have ears to hear that we may hear. Help us to become those who have hands and feet and eyes and ears those and mouth to be those for you so that when we see a need we may come to you and we may also in the appropriate times go towards those who are are in need we just ask that your blessing will be upon us on this day and in the days to come so that as we are seeking your direction, we will be able to find your presence in our midst. We ask your blessing now in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray these words when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come
come to our time of offering this morning, I'm going to just make an announcement here about um, a special offering that um, I'm going to lift up over the next two weeks. And that is for uh, the organization called After the Storm. It is our United Methodist Presence that has been working both in Gaylord after the tornado two years ago and the floods two years ago to get things taken care of. They will now, they are on the front line of the floods that are happening now. One of the reasons why there are still hundreds of homes left that have not been uh, taken care of is that the grants that they have received, or many of the grants that they have received from FEMA and uh, other governmental agencies have been for running the, for staffing and do, and getting case managers and so on. But the money that is coming in for uh, actual work on the homes that need to be done come in and in little squirts that barely do it. She used up her last, Cheryl Tipton, who is the resource director, uh, she used up her last Home Depot gift cards that she had received on the two houses that we were working on. And she can't do any more work on any more houses until more money comes in. It's not that we need to be, it's not that we need to be paying, but that we, are called to support those who are doing work with those who are the least and the lost. And after having been in the home of Gloria and her family, and having met Pat and his wife, the two homes that we were at, there is definitely need. For we do not understand abject poverty the way that they are living. And so I invite that over the next two weeks that you pray about what you can give so that we are able to send funds for repair work that needs to be done and, and that there will be those who can do that work who will step up and volunteer. So I'm, I'm not asking for that today. I'm asking for it for the next two weeks. I will be lifting it up because you weren't prepared today. Unless you, unless you have a really big checkbook and want to write one today, that's okay. But, um, <laughs> okay, I'm being goofy now. But I'll tell you what, the, the brokenness that is still in those homes, not because of the buildings, not the brokenness of the buildings, but the brokenness of people's spirits is dramatic. And we are called to change hearts and to let them be, to help them be healed. David and Natalie Oates and I were privileged to be able to help in that process. And I want to offer that opportunity for you. So as we come now, I invite you if you have an offering to bring forward, to bring those forward, and uh, as we continue to worship now.
give, receive what we can do, that we may bring honor and glory to your name for the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name. in your life. 